Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Metropole TV, the first 24-hour business channel here in Kenya and in East Africa. This is The Smart Investor. My name is Alikan Satchu. I'm your host. We've got a great second half as well. We've got uh, the Jumia Kenya Chief Executive Officer who's going to come and talk to us about their listing, about the opportunity, and whether Jumia is really an African e-commerce company. But that's for later. Let me start with, of course, something you've all noticed, surely. Pump prices rose. Super petrol was up 5 shillings, 25 cents. Diesel up 5 shillings and 52 cents. And kerosene up 2 shillings and 76 cents. Now, you would have known that because we tend to lag the international market by about six weeks in terms of pricing. Have a look at this chart. This is WTI. It's called West. Texas Intermediate. Uh, this and Brent crude are the benchmark uh, oil, uh, oil contracts. You can see that since December, the oil price of oil has been rising, and that's now beginning to feed through into our prices here in Nairobi. Of course, don't forget about half the price is the real price of oil. The other half, 50%, uh, is actually taxed. The government's taking about half of the price in tax as well. And of course, they put on VAT not too long ago. What was interesting, however, was P.S. Kamau saying in, a, in, a, in an announcement today that there would be over 200 wells will be drilled in the next two years. A lot of excitement around the oil, trying to find some more. Of course, we've got the oil in Turkana, but there, is, there are expectations that there are six oil basins in Kenya. And the Turkana was the one that everyone's found it so far, but they're prepared to explore into, into these six other basins as well. Looking outside, we still haven't had enough rain, although I know it's drizzling, but the World Bank in their uh, economic outlook for Kenya said specifically that uh, we could have a decline in GDP because of the potential drag from drought. So keep a close eye on, on the rain. Of course, keep a close eye on that wonderful perfume when the rain hits the ground. Just, you can show off to your friends. It's called Petri Chor, the nectar of the gods. That wonderful smell you get when the rain hits the ground and releases these wonderful, uh, 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 this wonderful perfume. Kenya's maize maize. Now, this is concerns about the shortage of unga. Um, millers uh, are saying there is no way there are 21 million bags of maize in the country. Uh, biting shortage has sent the price of flour to 119 shillings for a two kilogram packet. Uh, the miller said this, we highly doubt that there are 21 million bags of maize in the country right now. If that were the case, then we would be having this maize coming to the millers because of the competitive price we're offering. So it is a bit of a mystery. You'll have to take your pick as to what is the exact truth around this whole maize saga. But it seems that the millers are saying there is a, a big shortage in the market. So we've got to watch that extremely carefully. Food prices, the price of bread can always trigger reactions and the government's got to be tread very carefully around this. Bamburi Cement, which has a majority shareholder of Lafarge, reported full year results uh, early this morning. And a couple of things I wanted to point out. Profit dipped, well not dipped, slumped 83% to 680 million shillings. Turnover grew by 3.7%. But expenses, operating costs, grew by 14.749%. So you can see they eked out a turnover gain, but they were unable to keep a lid on their expenses. Um, they say uh, that basically it was around energy and the price of inputs, which caused that increase in the cost base. Let me give you some more data, however. Profit for the year, 614 million versus 1.973 billion the previous year. That's a big hit, 68.88%. Earnings per share was 2 shillings and 45 cents, but they are paying more than twice that 
out in a full year and total dividend, which is unusual um, to find companies paying more than the earning out as dividend. Um, but obviously, they're looking forward and thinking, look, we've got a strong, robust business and we can afford to do this. You can't do it too often. As we all know in our personal finances as well, if you start using up the capital, that's when your problems start. And here we're seeing them using up some of that capital. Uh, cement volumes in Kenya, they said, declined by 5%. We've heard a lot of talk, anecdotal chatter about that. There you get it. The proper, so this is the first time, I think, in many years that we're seeing a decline in cement consumption. It tells you that the economy is not, is, is not that strong and it's telling you people are slowing down on whether it's building a house for themselves or building a commercial building. 5% year on year, that's a big drop and it's a proxy for GDP. And uh, we'll have to keep an eye on that. But what I found interesting was about Bamburi Cement is although the Kenyan market shrank, they grew market share. So what that tells me is in a weak market, they went, after the, they went after the competition. They reduced their profits, but they went to take more market shares. That was a very interesting uh, development. And what it's telling me, it's quite Darwinian in the cement sector. And Lafarge are telling us they're one of the fittest, and therefore they will survive. Others, of course, have had tremendous problems like ARM, East African Portland, which is trying to flip a whole lot of land. Um, and, and you can see that there have been problems in that sector. The Seychelles president, Danny Fauré, went deep underwater in, in the Seychelles to, to pronounce his worries and concerns about the blue economy. First ever live speech from an underwater submersible. Um, and he says he's making a plea for stronger protection of the beating blue heart of our planet. This is the maritime economy, the ocean. People are waking up to the fact that it's a tremendous resource, but we've been kind of using it up and abusing it. Just have a look at the plastic that's in the oceans. Foray's speech says that this issue is bigger than all of us, and we cannot wait for the next generation to solve it. We are running out of excuses to not take action and running out of time. Just to give you some numbers, Seychelles has a population of just 90,024 people. It's the smallest population of any independent Afri African state. And they get three times more tourists than the entire population. If we had those same numbers, we'd be getting 125 million tourists a year. I don't think we'd be able to manage it. Nigeria at a crossroads. Nigeria's population growth is outpacing economic growth. I was talking about this before. This is why people are feeling less well off in Nigeria. This is why they're saying things like we can't eat GDP. The population growth is, is about twice what the GDP growth is doing. So in fact, Nigerians every year on average are worse off than they were the year before. Nigeria will have the world's third largest population by 2050. In this article in Bloomberg, they're saying without robust economic growth, it's a recipe for a disaster. And this is why you know, GDP expansion tends to be a silver bullet. It floats everyone's boats. But here in Nigeria, it's not floating the boat. In fact, it, 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 there, there are holes in the boat. Now, in 2000, some 1.4 billion people lived at or below the glo global uh, poverty line. Today, the number is about 600 million. And this has all been about China and India, predominantly China. China have lifted close to a billion people out of, out of poverty in a very short space of time. So then they have distorted these numbers. But basically, the count now in, in Nigeria stands at more than 90 million who are living at, in, in this sort of poverty trap. Even assuming that the proportion of Nigerians living in extreme poverty stops rising as quickly as it has in recent years, it's on course to remain extraordinarily high for the foreseeable future. And then they ask, one wonders whether a politician known as Baba Goslo, that's President Buhari's nickname, because he takes a lot of time to make decisions, 
is up to the task. And I think the Nigerian model is broken. It needs fixing. But I don't see which of these politicians is ready to, to grab this bull by the horns and try and fix it. Let's go back to Ebola, where we've had Ebola on the Uganda, DRC, Congo border, predominantly in DR Congo. 20 new cases were reported last Wednesday. 20 seems like a small number, but this is the highest number of infections in a single day since this, since this breakout in August 2018, which has already killed 764 people. It's eighth month, uh, outbreak is sickened 1,206 people, killed 764. According to Doctors Without Borders, more than eight months into the outbreak, the situation is alarming. The number of reported cases has significantly increased over the past few weeks. And the thing about viruses is they're very interesting mathematically. You can go from 1 to 100 to 10,000 to a million in a very short time. It's called exponential. And this is what viruses are. They exhibit exponential characteristics. So when you see these jumps, the number might, absolute number might not look that big, 20. But 20 is a big number in the context of how fast it can spread. It can spread like wildfire. And people say it's about its escape velocity. At 20, there's an escape velocity building into that number. The IMF has been holding its spring meeting in Washington. Our central bank governor is visiting. Um, our finance minister, uh, uh, Henry Rotich, is there as well, amongst many others, I suspect. And a couple of points that I picked up from this spring meeting Africa needs to create 20 million jobs per year just to absorb the Africans who are coming into the workforce. That's a big number. And the question I would ask is, how many are we actually creating? Are we creating many? I don't think so. Talking about the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, the AFCTA, about which I'm very bullish. I believe our people are entrepreneurial. I believe if you break the borders, let people do business, everyone's going to win, from the grassroots right up to the big companies. So I'm all for it. And I think you know the problem is you get resistance from people who've done very well from the current system. But the point is it will be 1.2 billion people and a combined GDP of $2.5 trillion. So as far as I'm concerned, the sooner we get it, the better. Now, let's move on. I've got my guest coming. He's the J Jumia Kenya um, uh, Managing Director. Um, he's going to come in the second half. But let me give you some scene setting. Jumia listed on the New York Stock Exchange on Friday. It surged as much as 75%. Remember, we were talking about WPP scan groups once in a decade move. That was 71.47%. At one point on Friday, Jumia was up an eye-watering 75%. A lot of people look at it as the Amazon of Africa. Um, that's the nickname it, it's been given. It has 4 million customers in 14 countries. Its retail platform is not profitable yet. Sales jumped by 40% last year to $147.3 million um, uh, at the last count. Now. I like this quote. Um, this is about uh, why people are buying this share in New York. They're interested in rising per capita incomes, an increasingly young and urban population, falling internet and data costs, surging mobile phone penetration. And it is these long-term trends which underpin the rise of the African online consumer. In Africa, only 1% of retail sales are being conducted on e-commerce. In China, it's 24%. So people are thinking to themselves, these Jumia guys have got a first mover advantage. They're already in four countries. They can maybe parlay that into a really significant advantage. And when you look at the size of the economy and the size of the opportunity, that's what's getting people interested. That's why the share rose over 50% on Friday. 
just as I was walking in, it's up another 12%. I still think it's a buy, actually. They've got interesting shareholders, MTN, just over 25%, but we'll come to that conversation in a bit. Now, uh, uh, Bob Collymore has also uh, been talking about this sort of platform business, e-commerce platform, that's what um, uh, uh, Jumia is. And essentially, the, the nirvana for a lot of these companies, including our Safaricom, including uh, Jumia, is to become an, an Uber platform, right? So everybody's doing business on your platform. That's the real attraction. That's why people are prepared to look through losses of nearly a billion dollars at Jumia and say to themselves, but you know, it's a little bit like Amazon. When they start making money, they're going to be coining it. That's for something for us all to find out. Uber, also a similar platform-based business. They also have announced that they're going to IPO. The expectation is the, they will raise $10 billion. And it just took me back to when Uber turned up here and it was a Malcolm Gladwell level arrival, right? You know, Malcolm Gladwell spoke about the tipping point, the magic moment when an idea, trend or social behavior crosses a threshold, tips and spreads like wildfire, he said. Uber is the best example I can find of exactly that. I think it took about 90 days for them to become the biggest taxi company here in Nairobi. So big opportunity. We understand Uber well and I think Uber too will prove to be as much of a buy as Jumia. Um, uh, this new high-tech millennial crypto trading avocado economy exhibits viral wildfire and exponential non-linear characteristics not unlike Ebola. So that's what people, gets people excited. It can take off all of a sudden. My perspective on both shares are that they're both a buy, and I think um, uh, Jumia will produce good returns. Um, who knows what will happen in the future, but you know, somebody like Amazon or Alibaba might just come in and think, you know what, they've already got a footprint, let's just buy them out. Alternatively, they can build their organic business, which they've been doing until now, but we're going to look into this more deeply in the second half of this program. Now, um, so, you know, it's all about that platform, isn't it? It's, this is a platform economy. We need to keep an eye on, on, on that component of it. Jumia, now this is a question that's come up a lot. It's incorporated in Germany. It runs the largest e-commerce business across Africa in 14 countries, including Nigeria, Kenya, Morocco, and Egypt. Incorporated in Germany, headquarters in Dubai, central tech team based in Portugal, and will be and is listed in New York. So that's another issue we're going to bring up. It's, there's been a lot of debate around this. What constitutes an African company? Why is Jimmy call, calling itself one? And we're going to address that um, uh, in a little while. I thought, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very sophisticated public and investor relations. Um, they're indigenizing their brand and nearly every successful company in Africa needs to indigenize, otherwise they tend not to succeed. So I look forward to speaking uh, with Sam in the second half. I just want to touch on a couple more things before we go to the break. Uzo bonds. Uzo bonds are Greek bonds. These bonds yielded at one time as much as 37%. If you'd had your wits around you, you'd have bought those bonds because look at what's happened. The yield has come down to below US government five-year bonds. In terms of bonds, when you buy them, you want yields to come lower because prices go higher. And this is what's happened with this particular Uzo bond. Who would have thought that Greece, which once upon a time was the basket case, the sick man of Europe, everyone thought it was needed to be put out of its misery, what a comeback. That, and you see that in these Uzo bonds. I wanted to touch on coal prices. The Chinese have actually been curbing the import of coal into China. We've seen a 30% price correction in the last eight weeks because of that Chinese behavior, the desire not to bring coal on uh, in the quantities that they were bringing, bringing coal into the country. So you've seen a 30% price correction. And on the point of energy, let me finish with this. 
We've spoken a lot of about Algeria, right? We spoke about Bouteflika, the wheelchair bound. We spoke about the people in the street. We still, it's not clear what happens next, but I don't think it's possible for the military in Algeria or in Sudan to, to do what they might have done 10, 20, 30 years ago. The, that time is gone. You can't do it. You've got to accommodate the street. You've got to be, get civilian as quickly as possible. You've got to give people a pathway to that civilian dispensation. Why is Algeria so important? Let me tell you, 33% of the natural gas that Europe buys comes from Algeria. If there's a problem in Algeria, where does Europe have to go to buy more gas? They've got to go to Vladimir Putin. And they don't want to be too dependent on the man in the Kremlin. So therefore, Algeria has a central... Spain, for example, half of their gas supplies come from Algeria. So when you think of Algeria, think of it as an, think of it as an energy issue as well, a geopolitical issue, and of course, a fast-moving and very fluid revolution. This is Metropole TV, the first 24-hour business channel here in Kenya and East Africa. This is The Smart Investor. My name is Ali Khan Sachi. We're going to dive into Jumia, the IPO at the NYSE, the whole e-commerce thing. How big can it be? And does Jumia have a first mover advantage? I look forward to seeing you after the break. Thank you for watching Metropole TV. Welcome back to Metropole TV, the first 24-hour business news channel here in Kenya and East Africa. This is The Smart Investor. My name is Ali Khan Satchu. I'm your host, and we've got a tremendous guest here today, Sam Chapat. Indeed. Sam, you are the Managing Director of Jumia Kenya. That's right. And we've just been, you know, Jumia has been like popping over the radar absolutely everywhere. Of course, you had the listing in New York yeah. on Friday. It went really well. I mean... Uh, price popped about 50. It's up, trading up again on the second day of the IPO, up another 10, 11 percent. So, so just contextualize that. Was that an important uh, milestone for you guys to get to the public markets at this point in time? I think it was. Mm. I think it was. I think you know, much more than the specific price, one moment to, 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 to the other. You know, we've got a very long-term perspective on on the opportunities mm. uh, in Kenya and in this market, you know, the continent more generally. And so, you know, and so we could take a very long-term perspective. The IPO itself, um, mm. I think, is an exciting moment. It's an exciting yeah. moment to you know, kind of take stock of the journey and the progress that has been made over the last seven years with a huge amount of, you know, support from our sellers, mm. trust from our customers and our teams. And, and investors as well. And investors, of yeah. course. Yeah. So let, let me just touch on a, a few points which, mm. which have popped up uh, around, you know, a lot of folks tell me, well, why couldn't they list in Nairobi, mm. Ali Khan? And I said, well, first of all, people are not used to investing in companies which have accumulated a negative equity position sure. of $900 million. But what, sure. what do you must have tried? And mm. what would you say do we have to learn here in Africa in order to get the likes of Jumia to list? In, on the continent. Yeah, so I think you know, the process that we, we went through as, as mm. we were thinking about this mm. um, was, you know, where are the capital markets mm. deep? Um, and, you know, i.e. there's lots of capital you know, around. And also where is the understanding of our business model mm. um, the best? Uh, and that's how we you know, looked at lots York. of options, we spoke mm. to a lot of investors, and, and that's how we ended up you know, in New York. So do they have an advantage in North America in understanding this new economy business model in whatever iteration it is? And how do we get our capital markets to, mm. to catch up? Yeah, I think, I think they do. I yeah. think they do have an advantage mm. in that in the sense that they've, they've seen it happen. Mm. And they've seen it happen multiple times. Right. And yes. so people understand the sort of the idea that you know, if you found product market fit, uh, you've got a good service that you know, your, your customers like, your sellers like if you're a marketplace mm. like us as well, then you need to scale. Mm. Um, and that you now have to take a medium term view on your ROI or you know, from an investor perspective. Sam, um, everyone's been bringing up this point about are you really African? Mm -hmm. 
um, you're saying that you know you're incorporated in Germany and mm -hmm. that you've got people all over the world um, and how do you respond to that because it's been quite passionate debate uh, I've been seeing on social media in particular how do you respond to that what, what do you say to people I think yeah everyone's obviously got a right to, to their own opinions yeah. um, I think you know our, our, our perspective on this is 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 that we're targeting 100% consumers in Kenya mm. and in the rest of the continent. All of our customers are here. We are designing our services to meet their needs and then to improve their lives, to help them save money and mm. time. Um, we are building services and solutions for Kenyan vendors, Kenyan SMEs, Kenyan big, uh, big, uh, big sellers, big brands, as well as those in the rest of the continent. We hire Five, we've had 5,000 people across the continent, mm. um, uh, you know, many hundreds in Kenya, um, and are investing in their skill sets and their training to help them become the next generation of, of entrepreneurs. You know, I personally strongly believe there's going to be a Jumia mafia around the continent, <laughs> um, similar to what's happened in other parts of the world. Mm. In fact, there already are. I think there was an article I saw recently with you know, the 15 first companies that have been launched across the continent from the first 50 employees of Jumia. Wow. So, you know, if that continues... So you've got a spillover effect yeah, going on. Yeah, I think huge spillover effect. Mm. And so I think, you know, we, we're, we're fully focused on this continent. We are here for the long term. The vast majority of our teams and of our management and leadership are, 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 are African. Mm. Um, you know, our, our business, for example, in Kenya is registered in Kenya. It has a Kenyan team, Kenya management team, um, to a very large extent. Mm. Um, and we're trying to solve Kenyan problems um, and adapting our business model making decisions here as, as needs be. Mm. And if you're thinking about registration, or if you're thinking about you know, ownership, you know, I think that's, that's, that's an important topic. Yes. I fully agree. Mm. Um, but it's a, there are many big companies here in Kenya yes, which, which are in a similar position. Yeah. And then if people want to buy a bit of Jumia, they can go and buy it. Absolutely. The world is flat and you, can, you can buy these shares relatively easily. Absolutely. Now, let me ask you another question. You know, I, I listened to Mr. Colin Moore and mm -hmm. he talks the e-commerce opportunity, mm -hmm. the platform, he mm -hmm. called it. Um, uh, I, I listened to, you know, you've got big boys out there, Alibaba, sure. who keeps flying into Africa. You've sure. got, you know, you've got Amazon, Bezos. Mm -hmm. Do you feel you've got to run twice as fast as everybody else, or do you feel you've got a first mover advantage now and it's for them to come and catch up with you? I think for, for now we're very much focused on, on our game. And we're mm. focused on, on how do we build trust mm. and help explain how e-commerce works to consumers and to sellers in our markets to bring more people online and more people into the e-commerce category. And so that's what we're focused on, 100%. Let me, now, t t I, you know, I saw some numbers in the prospectus sure. and uh, talking about, I think last year was $170 million mm -hmm. of total volume across your, mm -hmm. across your network. I think it was up 40%. Mm -hmm. When we look at a, this opportunity, when we were saying 1% penetration, I mean, when I see that kind of number, I just think from one to two, you're going to double potentially, or even more. If you so, is this really a blank canvas opportunity when you look at it, or are there technical difficulties which make it difficult to execute, and which therefore we should not apply the same rule as we'd apply elsewhere? I think the the global benchmarks. If you look at if you look at you know there there are, there are reports that have been put out on this you know that mm. track the evolution of e-commerce as a share of retail, which is the number that you referred to, yes. right? The twenty four percent in China. Mm. If you look at that across multiple geographies, it's quite consistent, mm. and I think it comes down to the sort of network effect or the the, the, the confidence building effect that the te technology often has, which is when you know you're a friend of mine, mm. you've tried a service, you have confidence confidence in it. Okay, I start to pay attention and start that's to do right. the same, and that's what causes this you know, fast growth yeah. uh, and that this real acceleration at some point. The benchmarks, I think, are you know, well, if you look at India, you know, India is something like eight percent penetration. Oh, today. as much as that. Mm. Something between you know, seven and eight, depending what you're, mm. you're, you're you're reading. You know, the U.S. 
What's that? Something on the long lines of 12%. Yes. So um, China is an outlier then. Absolutely. Mm. Well, China is just ahead of the curve, I yeah. think, is, is, is the point. So I think the, the, the growth potential is very large. Do we think that there are blockers inherently in Africa that will make it, will stop us from achieving that on this continent? I think absolutely not. I think there's, there's an argument that says it's more the opposite, which is that you know, the, the supply mm. here is, in the offline retail world, is much more constrained than it is, for example, in the US. Wow, right. that's interesting. Um, you know, I think if you look at the, you know, the numbers of, of people, and the population per retail outlet, it's got nothing, you know, Africa doesn't have a demand problem, it has a supply problem. Is that right? That's um, interesting. And so that's what the opportunity is. So we, we, you know, we believe that the potential here could be, could be bigger. So what you're telling me is the consumers have not been able to get what they want. Absolutely. And you're, you're, you're making sure they can. Absolutely. I mean, again, like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Without, without a doubt. Now, br break it down to us because it, obviously there's the e-commerce where you're supplying um, goods to people, people yeah. are buying it from you. What else are you, are you doing? Eats? Uh, I know you have got a partnership with Perno Rica, where you do me a party. I haven't tried that yet. Sure. <laughs> Shame, tell us should. Says, yeah, I will, but tell it's us. It's about that time of night. <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> um, yeah, so we know we, we have um, three main, uh, you know, categories today mm. um, in Kenya. Um, we have Jumia, which is the e-commerce platform, which is where you buy products to save time and money. Um, and vendors sell products. Again, mm -hmm. platform, there's the two sides of the mm -hmm. equation. Um, you have Jumia Food, which is a platform where you order food from a restaurant. Yeah. So on the one side, you have restaurants that list for your area, and the other side, you have customers that come and order mm -hmm. that pizza, and then mm -hmm. Jumia delivers um, that to, to consumers. Um, and then you have Jumia Travel, yes. which is where you want to go and book a holiday, uh, or book a hotel, or book a flight. And then underpinning the, you know, that, and, and you know, again, aimed at, making that business possible and improving everyday lives, you have services that support it. Mm. So for example, we have a logistics business, which helps us work. Is that your business? Which is our business, yes. which is again, a marketplace. Yep. So again, we're not aiming to buy lots of trucks and compete with local mm. you know, you know, logistics companies. We're aiming to create a platform to help connect them to demand. And so we have you know, dozens of 3PLs, logistics companies here in mm. Kenya that are part of our platform, both the big guys like the Fargos, mm. um, as well as many, many, many smaller um, you know, SME type uh, guys that are delivering Jumia packages. Mm. Um, same thing with finance or financial products. So what we are, are you doing with financial products? We are. I mean, we again, we're building a marketplace. So yes. our aim is to build platforms. Um, and so, so what people can come and offer financial products? Correct. Uh, to I could, for example. I, yeah, I mean, again, if you had the right, you know, but what regulations. Sort of, what sort of financial uh, marketplace are you trying to create? So today what we do is we help connect SMEs to financing. Ah. So on the vendor seller side, we're helping solve the access to working capital. Challenge. Yes. And so we use our data on the sales of those vendors yes. to help de-risk the lending decision for finances, for lenders. Wow. And that's what we're already doing today, you know, and, and helping make those connections, which is which is a huge impact and creates a yes, huge yes. uptick in jobs. No, but that's should come that's, to that. that that's that's a massive opportunity. It's a big opportunity. In the SME sector. Um, and, uh, I think everyone's been looking for how to make it work effectively. Yeah. I, who's providing the capital to lend to these? Uh, I mean, various lenders of different yeah. sizes, and it could be like micro, you know, micro finances. It could mm. be banks. It could be you know everyone. Like you know, the aim for us is to provide the the technology and the platform, and the data to help make that possible. Because we really believe in the job creation that can come of this. A report that was put out by BCG two weeks ago. Yes, I haven't read it. I, I think it's very interesting. It talks about marketplaces or platforms, mm. as you say. Mm. It says that. By 2025, there'll be 3 million net jobs across Africa from online marketplaces. Is that right? Which is and we need to create 20 million a year. Well, uh, this can be a part of this. Wow, that would be a, a, a substantial a part, part of it. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about your personal experience. I mean, you, you came out, you were telling me you were in Ghana, you set sure. up the business in Ghana. Sure. And you know, what's the journey been like? Because this has been at the cutting edge, the cold face of this new economy. And give us a little bit of a feel of sure. your challenges and your greatest successes. Yeah, sure. I've, I've sort of wanted to be in this part of the world um, for, for a very long time. I think mm. since I was 18, I have really believed in 
the big picture stuff and love the people and the culture. Mm. And so have always wanted to be out here and then jumped at the opportunity to leave um, you know, a strategy consulting house. Um, uh, that's your background. That's my background, yeah. Mm. Focusing on retail, digital, mm. etc. Um, to join Jumia. And, uh, and back then was was not the same business that it is today. Yeah. Um, and From what you describe it, it's substantially wider than many people would know. Absolutely. Mm. Um, and, and basically helped lead the expansion of Jumia outside of the initial markets into six new ones. Yes. Um, so it was based in Accra and spent most of the time uh, flying around mm. trying to support the local teams like get up and get started. Mm. And when you start a marketplace, actually when, that's a very challenging thing. moment. Yeah, when people talk about platforms and the excitement of big platforms, which is definitely true. Yes. What they don't talk about as often is the challenge with starting platforms. No, sure. And I'm sure mm. you, you've had to bootstrap it at times, Absolutely. right? So it Absolutely. must have been quite hairy, I imagine. But good fun as well. Yeah. So tell me about what does what is, what is the opportunity look like to you five years down the road? I think the game plan for us is to continue to do what we're doing, yeah. which is you know, to continue to provide convenience for customers, more range, more choice, mm. better prices, uh, and in, in continuously getting better on the quality of our service that we provide. Um, on the vendor side, to continue to attract more sellers onto the platform. Again, that's key to, to choice and helping those sellers grow and build their sales channels. Um, and then same on, on, on the team side, really, you know, continue to invest to, to bring skills here and to, to train people um, you know, because as, as our business grows, we also need to step up. Like every year, you know, if you were head of, of CRM, you know, mm. like of, of our newsletters, for example, last year, it's not the same thing as, as this year, right? Yeah. You need to continue to get more sophisticated and, and better at the services that we provide. So our game plan is more or less to, to continue what we're, what we're doing. I think there are big there are big opportunities for us here in Kenya mm. around you know, out, the outside of Nairobi, I mean, broadly out, out, mm. getting out of Nairobi, I think we have not penetrated. How far have you penetrated so far? We deliver countrywide. Countrywide. Uh, we have, you know, over 100 pickup stations countrywide. Mm. Um, we are, but I think we are underpenetrated versus where we should be mm. uh, at this stage in the next tier of cities and more generally. So I think that's a big opportunity for us. I think another big opportunity is, is just becoming much more of an everyday service. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, a while ago we, we were focused on, on TVs and, and smartphones. Today we sell you know, millions of products mm -hmm. and, and our, amongst our largest categories are everyday products, you know, like groceries. Wow. Um, and I think that's a big opportunity for us on that. Let me ask you a question. About, mm -hmm. You know, I lived in the UK for many years and, you know, that was, it was second nature, right? You'd, yeah. You would you would buy takeaway food. You 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 know that whole lifestyle. Yeah. yeah. And when I look around here, I think to myself, surely the same thing is going to happen here, yeah. isn't it? Everyone is young. Yeah. Um, they're all both sides are working. Yeah. Who's got time to stand at the kitchen for a whole hour? Absolutely. Do you think that revolution is already happening? You're the one seeing it, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Has it already happened, mm -hmm. or, or or is it happening incrementally, or is it happening like that? I think it's going to make big changes. I think yeah. you know, th that transformation has, has already happened. Again, if you look at the evolution of, of these platforms in other parts of the world, yes. it takes a while for it to get going yeah. right? and to get into the early adopters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think it's starting to happen, absolutely. I think if you look around, you hear the number of people that are ordering pizzas on Jumia Food, that are ordering you know, a drink at night on Jumia Party, yes. um, uh, and that are ordering you know, on Jumia not once a year, which you might do for a smartphone, but yes. actually every couple of weeks is if that you're right? buying toothpaste online, yes or if you're buying water um, so your yeah. average consumer is touching you how often a month would you say many more times than they were wow. um, and and that's a, again a big a big focus mm. for us the challenge in businesses like yours has always been thought to be logistics fulfillment mm. finding mm. where somebody actually lives is that becoming easier now or is that still a complex a, a, a bit of complexity to the business I think we've just got better at it. Mm. Um, I think you know we have understood um, how customers think about their addresses better, um, so that we can already quickly narrow down to the to the general area that they live, for example, um, and then try and 
use the historical data or maybe over time you know, with their permissions use their geolocation on their phones to help make that experience slicker mm. um, so we've, we've, we've invested a lot of time and energy in trying to understand that problem I don't think that's the biggest barrier for us today yes what is the biggest barrier I think the biggest barrier again is not data mm. it's not mm. connectivity mm. I think you know those the, those have been well covered mm. um, I think the biggest barrier for us today is is helping people learn how to use our services. Yes. I think a lot of people, you'd be surprised. A Bob lot told of people. me once that no one knows what a smartphone is if they haven't tried it. So they, they, they don't know what to expect. Precisely. So I suppose Precisely. you've got to get people. Precisely. Precisely. That's, that's exactly it. Mm. You know, people, it's, it's hard to understand that when I've, you know, I've seen a photo of a pizza mm. and I click a few buttons, that, that pizza's going to arrive, and not in five hours, like mm. in half an hour, mm. that pizza's going to arrive from the restaurant you chose it from. Um, and that's what we've got to you know, raise understanding of. And that's, that's really our job. I think that's one. And the second thing is around trust. Like it's around building confidence. Do people confidence. have confidence now? I mean, you know, one of the big problems here has been things like fraud. Mm -hmm. How are you dealing with that? I think that's, again, another important element of, of this whole IPO process and everything else. Like, you know, we guarantee the quality of, of the experience on Jumia, whether it be on travel, food, or, or whatever else it might be. And, and so, yeah, I think it's not, it's not an easy topic. Like, you know, for example, you know, product quality comes up a lot. Um, and those are market dynamics. Yes, that, market. that's not, you can't control. That's not, that's not yeah. Jumia doing anything specifically, but those are market elements. However, we have a responsibility to do better. And we yeah. have a responsibility to use technology and data to try and do even better than the offline market. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you today, Sam, and wishing you a tremendous amount of success. And if the share price is anything to go by, I, I think you know you've got it in the bag. Um, I would, I would, be, I'm very grateful for uh, you coming in today on this sure. big occasion. We'd sure. like to have you back again to sure. look deeper into this whole e-commerce economy and the platform economy. Yeah, I'm happy to. I'd like to thank Sam Chapat of Jumia Kenya, the managing director, who's been our guest in the second half. This has been Metropole, T Metropole TV, the uh, smart investor. And we've got some breaking news to give you, and it's fairly unbelievable. Notre Dame apparently is on fire in Paris. This was the very famous uh, church where the whole story of Victor Hugo, I think, if mm. I'm not mistaken, the hunchback of Correct. Notre Dame. So we, we're going to now uh, switch to that piece of news. But once again, thank you for stopping by. Please join us at 8 p.m. every evening on Metropole TV, The Smart Investor, and we get smart guests like we've just had today <laughs> who are going to tell us about the lay of the land and where we should invest our money. I think we should put some money to work in your share. Very kind. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. Thank, Thank you. you.